Welcome to part two of the new imperialism. Now we're going to look at the annexation of Hawaii. Hawaii was first discovered by British Captain James Cook in 1778 when he landed on the island of Kauai. He would return a year later and in a dispute with the Hawaiians actually would be killed by them in 1779. In 1795, the king of the Hawaiian Islands, Kamehameha, uh, is going to take control and consolidate the power of the Hawaiian Islands into a single monarchy, right? And he would finish this uh, actually through the final conquest of Kauai in 1809, right? By 1819, his son, Liholiho, would abandon the religious system, the kapu system, which was their religious faith. The following year, you would actually have Christian missionaries arrive from the United States to Hawaii, and the Hawaiian people would convert to Christianity. Apparently, these missionaries had an uncanny sense of timing. Right? So, by 1835, you're finally going to have the first American plantation established in Hawaii, when Ladd and Company is going to create a sugar plantation on the islands. And this is going to be the beginning of some very serious American and to a lesser degree European business interests coming to Hawaii and uh, establishing plantations, right? Five years later, you have a bunch of American plantations established and these foreign business uh, uh, influences managed to convince the Hawaiian monarchy, remember this is all just a monarchy, to restructure itself into a constitutional monarchy, right? They codified their laws and they uh, created a constitutional monarchy based on the Western model, okay? Now, business interests were mostly Americans, uh, but by 1880s, the United States had multiple trade treaties, not only with the United States, but also with Europe, and American growers held large tracts of land and a large percentage of the arable land in Hawaii. So by the 1880s, American business interests were having a pretty uh, significant influence over the monarchy itself. Uh, so much so, in fact, that in 1887, they got King Kalakaua to sign a new constitution. Now, this new constitution was referred to by its opponents as the bayonet constitution, you know, signed at the end of a bayonet, right? This new constitution reduced the monarchy itself to effectively just a figurehead, right? Voting also was severely curtailed by this new constitution. If you wanted to vote for members of the legislature, which was now the center of power, really, uh, the voting was restricted only to landowners, which meant that it was mostly the Americans and that small scattering of Europeans that owned the plantations. They owned 80% of the land of Hawaii. This effectively disenfranchised most Hawaiians from voting, and also a large number of Asian workers, mostly Japanese, who had migrated to Hawaii to work these cane fields. So for these American business interests, life is really good here. You've got effectively control of this monarchy. You're producing tons of sugar that's getting shipped back to the United States. Life is great until 1890. In 1890, Congress is going to pass what was called the McKinley Tariff right? The McKinley Tariff suddenly made Hawaiian sugar far less profitable, right? And here's the reason why. The McKinley Tariff uh, put a large import tax, which is what tariff is, right, on, uh, uh, on foreign products, including foreign sugar. Well, yes, it's American businesses in Hawaii, but it's a foreign nation, right? It's a sovereign foreign nation. So any of the sugar being produced there and brought to the United States is subject to this tariff. All of a sudden, Hawaiian sugar is not profitable anymore. And these sugar uh, growers are suddenly panicked. Like, what do we do? How can we get rid of this tariff? Well, the easiest way to get rid of this tariff is to make Hawaiian sugar no longer foreign sugar. Make it domestic sugar. The logical solution to the problem was to eliminate the monarchy and ask for annexation and make Hawaii part of the United States, right? So the following year in 1891, uh, King Kalakaua died and he was uh, uh, succeeded by his sister. His si sister, Lilulu Kalani, became queen of the Hawaiian uh, monarchy, right? And she was having none of this uh, power being exerted by these plantations. She was ready for a final showdown. She was going to try and push back, right? The first thing she did was she fired all the members of her cabinet, right, who were mostly Americans, and replaced them with strictly Hawaiians. 
The American uh, planters responded to this by forming a group called the Annexation Club, led by a planter named Lauren Thurston. Okay. Um, the American uh, uh, businessmen, of course, controlled the legislature, and they voted her cabinet out of office. Said, no, nah, you got to pick a new uh, uh, set of cabinet members. She picked a whole new set of Hawaiians to fill the cabinet. They voted them all out again, and they, get, they did this at least seven times. She would bring a whole new set of Hawaiians in. They would vote them out. This kept going back and forth. On January 14, 1892, the Queen announced that she had a new constitution to get rid of the bayonet constitution, replace with this new one, which would effectively restore most of her powers as a monarch, right? The ones that had gotten lost because of the uh, uh, bayonet constitution. The Annexation Club, Club responded to this by forming a committee of safety and then drafted papers for setting up a provisional governor, uh, a provisional government rather, and ousting Lulu Kalani, kicking her out of power, right? So the Queen protested to the United States Minister to Hawaii, the effective ambassador to Hawaii for the United States, a man by the name of John Stevens, saying, hey, you need to get these businessmen under control. Now, what she didn't know is that John Stevens was actually the chief collaborator and a member of the Annexation Club and was uh, uh, directly involved in this plot to overthrow her. On January 17, 1892, U.S. Marines were on a ship off, uh, off the coast, and they were ordered to come to shore by John Stevens in order to, as he put it, protect American lives and property. The Marines came to shore. They didn't really actually have, Stevens didn't have the authority to actually order them to do this, but they thought he did. They, come to the, they came to shore, they seized government buildings, and Stevens officially recognized the provisional government that had been established by the Committee of Safety, right? They put Hawaiian Supreme Court Justice Sanford Dole in the position of, of, of appointed president of the, um, of the provisional government. So Sanford Dole is now president of this provisional government of Hawaii. Lilu Kalani is going to issue a statement relinquishing her throne, but under protest, right? And she's actually going to send a petition to the United States government saying, hey, you need to get your people out of control. But she did that in order to avoid violence. Uh, and she figured she would just work through diplomatic channels to have the U.S. government reinstate her. The representatives for both the Queen and these uh, planters rushed to Washington to make their case, and the planters uh, asked for immediate annexation of Hawaii. At the time, the president was Benjamin Harrison. Uh, Benjamin Harrison was in favor of the idea of annexation Hawaii. As a matter of fact, he immediately recognized that provisional government and even submitted a bill of annexation to Congress. But that's as far as he took anything. He was literally days from leaving office, and he literally said, you know, Grover Cleveland's coming in. He'll, he'll take care of this. This isn't really my problem, right? So he really didn't take any action. But that little bit of action he did take is going to have some severe consequences, right? Grover Cleveland came to office, and he didn't share Harrison's enthusiasm about uh, annexing, annexing uh, Hawaii. As a matter of fact, he thought something doesn't feel right here. Right, so he uh, appointed a commissioner, a guy named John Blunt, and said, I want you to travel to Hawaii and investigate this popular revolution that these planters are saying it happened, because the planters are saying the people overthrew the queen. Right, so John Blunt travels to Hawaii. Now, the big five, the five largest sugar producers in Hawaii, including Castle and Cook Company, which eventually will become Dole Food Company, and its uh, founder was a cousin of, of uh, Sanford Dole, the current provisional president of Hawaii, right? Assume that uh, John Blunt was really coming out to rubber stamp their call for annexation. Well, they didn't realize that Blunt was coming out there to actually do a real thorough and legitimate investigation. So these big five uh, were pretty surprised when he comes out there he, uh, and determined that Queen Lulu Kalani had been deposed against the wishes of the people. He said, this is not a pop popular uprising. This is American businesses overthrowing a sovereign nation, right? And so he recommended to President Cleveland that she be restored to the throne. The queen needs to be restored to the throne. Cleveland's response with, uh, uh, to this was to fire John Stevens, right? The minister to Hawaii. And he replaced him with another minister named Albert Willis. And Albert Willis went to Hawaii and called for 
the restoration of the queen. Basically told these businessmen, says, the government of the United States demands that you restore the queen to the throne. However, the provisional government of Hawaii and Sanford Dole refused. They said that the United States has no business meddling in Hawaii, Hawaiian affairs. This is kind of ironic, right? And so Cleveland will submit the issue to Congress for debate to decide whether or not the Cleveland would give, be given the authority to go in there and overthrow this provisional government by force and reestablish the queen. Now, Congress is going to debate this for a while, but they're going to they're going to decide they're going to say, well, you know, Harrison had recognized that provisional government, so we're going to take no further action. Right. So him recognizing it, doing that little bit of thing actually had a pretty profound impact. Meanwhile, in July of 1894, that provisional government officially declared itself a republic, called himself the Republic of, ha uh, of Hawaii, and Sanford Dole that you see pictured here remained president. As you can see, he's a big fan of the Lorax. Okay. Um, Queen Lulu Kalani was placed under her house arrest, and she was tried for treason. She and six others of her uh, compatriots were sentenced to death, but she was told that they would commute all of their sentences to uh, uh, to just house arrest if she would officially abdicate the throne. Now, needless to say, to save the lives of her friends, she willingly uh, did that. Um, so now for these businessmen, it was just a waiting game. Obviously, Grover Cleveland was not interested in annexing Hawaii, so they just needed to find a different president, right? When the election of 1896 rolled around, William McKinley, the same man that implemented the, uh, as a senator, implemented the McKinley tariff that started this whole uh, deal, was in favor of, an, of the idea of annexating Hawaii, and so he became uh, these businessmen's uh, candidate, right? Matter of fact, Hawaiian businessmen contributed somewhere around $4 million to the McKinley campaign, right? McKinley, as you already know, won that election. And by the summer of 1898, the United States was distracted by a war with Spain. And that was that last little piece of the puzzle they needed to slip an annexation bill into, um, into Congress. Uh, it'll pass Congress in June of 1898, be signed by the president on July 7th. And the official annexation of Hawaii will take place on August 12th, 1898. Now, what this marks in is the one and only time in U.S. history that the United States acquired land, but not through either war, treaty, or purchase. They got it this time through their own businessmen overthrowing a sovereign nation. 